I'm welcome again. Uh, thank you very much, Deepak. It's always good to be introduced by another man with a graying beard. Uh, so I do believe we are on the same generation platform. And uh, also nice for Hari, because it's also good to know a man who's got a lesser hair than even me. So, you know, I, I'm in very august company of extremely charitable and hospitable hosts. So I'm flawed at the very beginning. And uh, I want to just tell everybody, thank you very much for joining in on a Saturday morning. I know it's never easy, especially in this post-pandemic world where, you know, the lines between a working day and the weekend has become so blurred. And, uh, well, there's a reason why I wear this T-shirt, right? Bantering blues. So I said, let me try and stick to the theme. And uh, so, so I'll, I'll tell you my story. And, uh, you know, you've given me a long time to talk, but I would love to actually interact with you after... Uh, my brief uh, expression of my life uh, in short. And then we will see how it rolls from there. Does it sound okay, Deepak? Well, well you know, guys, a lot of you probably have seen me on, on television. Uh, many of you have uh, seen me go out there and, you know, kind of have these acrimonious exchanges with Arnav Goswami on Times Now, uh, get into this uh, massive slugfest with my good friend, Sambit Patra from the BJP, and the general perception that if you're in politics, you suffer from a serious case of you know, mental constipation or a verbal diarrhea. And I just want to let you know, you're not wrong. That, that is the problem with a lot of us in politics, that we get so consumed by our own personal obsessions to impress the world, that very often uh, we begin to kind of create a, a, an artificial wall uh, within ourselves. So, you know, people at the end of the day have two faces, one which is a very private one, and the other which is meant for public consumption. But you know, I have grown up with one simple funda in mind, and which is that you are what you are. And you know, you can't fundamentally be different no matter how much you're pretending to be. So to give you one example, I believe that anyone who loves dogs, anyone who's compassionate towards animals, uh, anyone who loves cats, uh, cannot but be a nice guy or a nice woman. When I say guy, I mean gender neutral. And I do feel that ultimately you are what you are. And so when Deepak and Hari have invited me for this, and I just want to call a spade a spade and tell you that the guy that you probably see on the screens and right now in front of you, very excited to chat and share his experiences, was once upon a time, a nervous, diffident, extremely awkward sort of a guy. Um, I was literally scared, if not paralyzed, in front of people. And there's a reason behind that. You know, I, I, I dig deep into it. And I thought about it uh, last evening, you know, before coming here as to what should I really tell you, uh, which probably the world doesn't know. And, uh, you know, let, let me tell you this. And I grew up in a, in a nice, modest Bihari household. My father uh, was you know, one of those guys who went to the London School of Economics and he did not know how to tie a tie. Uh, he was terrible with his shoelaces. But because he was a hard working, working man and had done reasonably well, he had managed to get a scholarship to the London School of Economics in those days, by the way, uh, when the only way to get there for anybody with a very modest income was to go by ship. And um, so I grew up in, in a household of very simple, modest people. Um, he came back, he became a professor. And typically in those days, uh, and I'm being very honest, uh, you were considered to be a, you know, a good looking or a real start or smart guy if you were tall, fair, and handsome, uh, which is you know, probably stuck on. Although nowadays they say someone who's tall, fair, and has some. But you know, let me skip those cheesy jokes. Uh, so when I was growing up, I mean, we were a family of three brothers and a sister. I had a massive inferiority complex. Uh, my, both of my brothers, elder brothers, I'm the youngest in my family, uh, are tall. You know, which in those days, by the way, was pretty unusual because the average Indian height was five, six, even five, eight was considered to be, you know, pretty much happening. But these, these both of my brothers were six feet plus, very fair, very good looking. And I was like a sickly child. Um, scrawny and you know not very impressive to look at 
and well, if I can say so, not very fair either. And uh, you know, no matter what you say, it's not that my parents gave me a complex. Parents were like wonderful, but you know, when relatives from Bihar would come in, they would make comments, and I would hear them. Hey, Raju or Bubu, to itna khubsurat hai dikhne mein, gora hai, lamba hai. Lagte hain ki ye log mardan ki hai. And Sanjay to ekdam thoda darpok type ka hai. Sanjay to thoda patla dubla hai, tum ye karega kya bada ho ke? I mean, that was a normal conversation in, in, in the household. And my father was extremely sensitive about it. So was my mom. But you could do nothing about people coming home and saying things like that. So I grew up very different, very nervous. I almost felt like I was a black sheep in my family, that I was going to be the one who would pull the family averages down. And, and my brothers were nice. But, you know, obviously, brothers being brothers, they were not feeling too bad about being flattered more than I was. So that is crucial to understand, because I do believe that as you get older, you do become somewhere a product of the circumstances in which you actually grow up. And uh, so to give you an example, I played reasonably good sports. I was uh, passionate about sports. So um, I was good in cricket. I mean, Deepak played this morning and uh, the last time I played, I remember, uh, you know, getting this batsman out who used to play with Sachin Tendulkar with my fairly deceptive offspin, but that was many years ago. But the fact of the matter is I was good in cricket. Uh, I was a terrific badminton player. Uh, I was in my school team for table tennis. And when I was in the sixth standard, I actually held the school champion of Bishop School Pune to a draw in chess. He was in class 11th in ISC and I was in class six and I held him to a draw. And the reason why I didn't win that chess was because there were crowds of the seniors, you know, uh, who were there because we played the chess match during the lunchtime. And crowds of those 11 standard boys who were like, you know, all over the place. And I got very nervous and I made one bad move. There's a reason why I tell you about being nervous in crowds. Uh, I grew up, therefore, awkward. I could not handle crowds. Uh, I could not handle pressure. I could not handle people watching me. Uh, I would be extremely shifty and, you know, ill at ease when I found people around. And, and that's important for you to know because ultimately uh, it affected me because I did not play chess for my school or college. I did not play table tennis or badminton or cricket for any of them. And there's only one reason why I didn't because I would not go for the selections. I would not uh, go for the trials. Uh, I would not go for the practice sessions because I said that meant being out of home more often. And therefore, you know, end of day, not my jam as, as the, you know, the millennials will call it today. Um, my sister-in-law, uh, who's from Pune, uh, he used to sarcastically call me as in ghar ki kumbri. Ghar ki kumbri is like the chicken of the house in Marathi. And, um, and she was true. She was right. I don't think she was being sardonic, actually. I think she was just making you know, lighter fun at my expense because I was terrible. I, I remember, for example, and I need to share this with you. Uh, there was a girl who was very interested in asking me out for a dance. And I must have been probably in first year of college. And I had, um, so, and, and she asked me, you know, would you like to come for a dance to this friend's house? And um, she liked me. I knew that. I liked her too. I liked her immensely, actually. I had a massive crush on her. But the thought of going out with her to a party and dancing was like, you know, sending, giving me cold shivers. So guess what I did? And, you know, you laugh at this. It sounds bizarre, I know. But uh, I actually oiled my hair. I had long hair that time. Gollywog hair, as my brother would say. I oiled my hair. And when she came to pick me up by car, you know, they shared a driver and stuff. And I said, no, I can't come with you. And she said, why? And I said, because I've oiled my hair. She was shocked. So she said, go and shampoo it and, and come. And I was like, you know, but if I shampoo it, I'll have to dry it. And, you know, I just gave some kind of an absolute third grade, you know, lily livered, irrational, stupid pretext to dodge out of the date. Now, which guy would do that in today's day and age? Uh, probably wouldn't need to because, you know, we live in an age of, Tinder and date apps. But I'm just going to say that, you know, I actually 
dodge that. That's how paranoid I was about just being out with people and you know making a fool of myself. It's the way I looked upon it. The black sheep of the family, scrawny, short, uh, not very impressive. So that's me. It's important for you to understand, you know, the the fact that, you know, somewhere down the line, uh, it, it was beginning to affect my personality. I did good in academics because, you know, I didn't have to meet anybody. I sat in my house and worked, burned the midnight oil, you know, mucked up my uh, paras, was good in maths and stats, did everything well. And frankly, academically, luckily, I was, I was pretty much top of the class. But as I say, sometimes in life, in fact, if not always, you need someone to show you the way. And I think, you know, we are all, all of us, I'm sure, have had somebody, maybe somebody in the family, a friend, uh, a love, uh, a boss, anyone who comes and just begins to make you feel different. And for me, it happened in Ferguson College in Pune. I was in Bishop School. I joined Ferguson. I was doing economics. And I met this guy who came in from, I think, Chennai. Uh, his father was in the IAS and he was transferred to Pune. And his name was Anand P. Raman. Anand P. Raman joined me in Ferguson College in economics. And Anand was a brilliant communicator. I mean, outstanding. Uh, he had a phenomenal deep baritone voice, tremendous knowledge. He was very well read at that very young age of college in the 1980s. And uh, frankly, uh, you know, when he spoke, he sounded somebody that you wanted to just talk and hear. And he became a very, very good friend of mine. In fact, we became the best buddies. Uh, we were both reasonably good in economics. He used to come first and I would come third or second, depending upon the semester. One particular time, Anand told me, Sanjay, how good are you at debating? And I was like, I hate debating. I hate standing up in front of people. There's a reason why he asked me that question. Uh, there was an intercollegiate debate competition between Ferguson College and, you know, uh, the Neswadia, and there would be other colleges in Pune. And, uh, and he said that in Ferguson, the only person who was to accompany Anand P. Raman had fallen sick on that particular uh, during that particular week and could not be necessarily uh, prepared or ready by the weekend. And he said, would you like to fill in? Because I think you're the best guy who can accompany me. I was absolutely appalled that Anand Raman, my good friend, would put me in so much of a you know, deep uh, sea or you know, throw me on from the top of the Amazon. I was like, you can't do this to me. I can't debate. I don't want to debate. And uh, I'm not coming. I mean, don't even suggest this. He said, no, I'll tell you why. Before I told you whether you want to debate or not, I've actually gone and told this to the professor who is in charge, who was the head of department for English literature. And he said, I've already told him that Sanjay is going to come and Sanjay is ready. And I was like, and he agreed. He said, yeah, he asked me that, do you think Sanjay can do it? And I said, yeah, I mean, he, he's, he's fantastic. He will do even better than me. And I was so angry. I was so agitated that I told Anand that I'm not going to come. I'm not going to debate. And, um, you know, he can do what he likes. I mean, he can go alone. Uh, the college can flunk it or disqualify itself, but I'm not coming. And I sucked and I went home. I was extremely uh, you know, distressed that I would be uh, speaking in front of people and uh, that I would have no choice in that decision. Anyway, so, you know, I was clear I was not going. So I went home and I narrated this story uh, to my father. My father said, so what's the big deal? What will happen? Kya hoga? Sabse bura kya ho sakta hai? You know, at the most people are going to laugh at you. They will say, yaar, ye and uh, it's okay. That's the worst that can happen, right? You're not, going to, you're not going to suddenly lose a leg or a hand. So I said, Papa, don't you have any understanding of the fact that it's not just about my personal humiliation. I will be bringing my college down. 
Anand Raman is a fantastic speaker, is a brilliant debater. Why do you think, uh, you know, I want to be in that awkward, uh, you know, acute discomfiture of being the loser who brings his uh, college down? But Dad said, well, you know, that's life, right? I mean, uh, it, there's only one other choice that your college doesn't even get a chance to qualify because there's no second debater. And Anand cannot go and debate on his own. He needs uh, you to just be there and let him go and perform. So that was, well, frankly, something that hit me pretty hard. That my Ferguson College, the college I loved, would not be able to even participate in the debate. While, you know, Anand, the brilliant debater, uh, would possibly then miss that opportunity. If nothing else, I know that the group would be lost. But if I went there, at least as an individual debater, Anand Raman would have a chance. Uh, to cut the long story short, Anand Raman, by the way, is today one of the uh, uh, people in the editorial board of the Harvard uh, uh, Business Review, the, the magazine that comes out. He's been part of the Harvard faculty for a long time. Uh, and I don't know, at some point, probably I'll send him this uh, recording of this conversation. Uh, so I went, right? Ladies and gentlemen, I went for that debate. And um, what I did was I, I mucked up the entire thing, just mucked it up literally word for word. I wrote a debate. I mucked my thing word for word. And um, so when the chance came for me to speak uh, against the motion, I think Anand spoke for the motion. The topic was on capital punishment, one of those generic uh, boilerplate topics. Um, I took off. I took off and I rambled. I don't think there was any intonation. There was no inflection. There was no voice modulation. It was nothing. Uh, I just had good content, I think, because I wrote a long case against capital punishment. And, uh, and I just rattled it off. I was in a hurry to finish my debate and um, just kind of conclude that excruciating torture that I had to endure for five minutes at a time. And I went on and on, and, and, and there was a bell at four and a half minutes to warn you that five minutes was going to be over. And at four and a half minutes, uh, the bell rang, and I, I probably didn't even hear the bell. I kept on and on and on, and at five minutes, the bell rang again, and then I was told that now you can take a seat. So I had not been able to finish my points, despite the fact that I was running at the speed of Tufan Express, and, uh, but I had finished. I mean, the, the, the ordeal was over. So when I came to occupy my seat next to Anand, he said, he clapped for me and he said, Sanjay, thank you very much for being here. Anand spoke. Um, I, I just felt good that I had been there. Um, you know, the, there were people who clapped when I had finished talking. Uh, I probably knew I was amongst the weakest debaters on that given day, not because of the content, but my terrible delivery and extremely awkward style of delivery, no hand movements, nothing. Anand was fantastic. If I remember correctly, uh, you know, obviously we, as a college, I flunked. So, I, you know, you're right. My fears were true. I had, you know, kind of prevented Ferguson College from probably being amongst the top three. But Anand did get an individual prize and he would not have got that prize if I hadn't been there. And something happened after that. Anand telling me, Sanjay, well done. Uh, gave me a strange sense of confidence. So much so that I remember he told me that every time you get an opportunity to speak, a little bit, whether it's raising your hand in class, going out there and you know, speaking and introducing somebody uh, in a college function, just coming on stage to play the role of a prop, uh, do anything, but just go there. It's okay. The world doesn't come to an end. The sky doesn't fall on your head. And I began to take his feedback in the right, earnest spirit. And I started, you know, actually forcing myself to ask questions in class, to volunteer to go and, you know, say something during a discussion. And I did go for a few more debates. Ladies and gentlemen, and here you are. Uh, you know, end of day, here I am, the national spokesperson, former, let me add that, of the Congress Party. I have been on television, tough debates, economics, foreign policy, society, governance. Uh, I have uh, 
you know, kind of been with the best anchors in the country, including many global ones. I have been a critic of, say, my opposition party's politics. I have, in fact, questioned the Prime Minister of India. And, you know, where are those fears that I once had, right? I mean, those fears have just kind of vanished. How did it happen? And one of the lessons I learned came, therefore, from what Anand Raman and, to some extent, my father said to me that time. So what's going to happen? And what can happen? And you say, well, frankly, nothing, nothing at all. I mean, you just got to stand up and do it. I remember when I joined XLRI for my uh, MBA. Uh, in the first year, you know, that time computers were pretty new and we had a professor who jacked everybody and gave everybody an air for a D plus and stuff. And I went up to the class and I, like a student union leader, I mobilized the entire XLRI class to say, let's go and protest to the Dean or to the director of XLRI saying, this course is not being held to the standards we expected, and we would like a revised grade or an opportunity for another exam. But that's exactly what happened. That was me, a guy who not too long ago would have shied away from anything remotely connected with being a leader. And here I was literally taking up the cause on behalf of people without even taking their permission. So, you know, one of the big lessons that I learned from, from all this was that do the very thing that you fear. So if you fear um, heights, for example, challenge it. So, you know, I'm not being great with heights either. Please don't think that I've got too many phobias, but I'm saying these are like things that happen. So I've been terrible with heights, you know? So, but when, it, when we went to the Grand Canyon and I remember at that massive height, there is this glass extension from the cliff. So there is this whole glass that extends from the Grand Canyon. It, it's also there in all these big tall buildings and, Toronto and Dubai and all that. But you know, this was a Grand Canyon and this was this big glass spreading out right into the open. And if you look down below the glass, you could see nothing but a steep precipice. And that could be a quite a monumental fall if you had one. And I went there and I looked down and I walked and I said, fight it, you're not gonna fall. Nobody's fallen before. Uh, you're not gonna be that privileged to make the headline the next day in the New York Times, just do it. And I did. Uh, I'm not great with snakes either. You know, snakes gave me the heebie-jeebies, um, literally, uh, you know, kind of shiver down my spine. But I remember we were in Singapore or someplace and my daughter took this huge python and put it on her shoulder. And I took the pictures and someone said, my wife said, now your turn, go and do it. And trust me, I didn't. But a little later, I remember when we were in another place and there was another snake to hold. I told myself, just do it. Just do it. Uh, and I did. And it was slimy, it was cold, and it was curled up. But I did. I am alive, right? I mean, I'm okay. And I know that was a non poisonous snake. But, you know, to break through these mental barricades and embargoes that we put is extremely crucial. Extremely crucial. Fighting fear, in my opinion, is the thing of life. Um, uh, you know, many of you may fear dogs. I may have had many of them all my life. And, but please tell yourself, dog is called a man's best friend for a reason. And I, and I do think that somewhere down the line, uh, these are manifestations of our own ability to fight back. Uh, I promise it won't take too long. So I'm going to uh, you know, kind of wrap this very quickly. But I want to let you know that uh, in a great number of ways, uh, we've become something that we haven't even imagined if we begin to dream it. So just think about it, all right? A man who was scared of speaking, a boy who was terrified of people, that I would end up one day being the national spokesperson of a political party, a virtually an everyday television guy, and besides speaking in events and all that blah, blah, I'm not even including that part. The other part, which is fascinating actually, is that I would in the year 2004, bring a company into India. Just imagine, I would bring a company into India, which is the world's best in public speaking. Dale Carnegie. You know, I pioneered that entire relationship along with my wife. And today, Dale Carnegie, which is in the how to win friends and influence people and how to be you know, great public speaker, blah, blah. Dale Carnegie is in India. It's our corporate venture. And the public speaking is something that is my business model. I mean, they, these are two remarkable situations that explain to you 
how life can take you to a different place once you just begin to probe, traverse, and take those risks. So I want to conclude here by telling you that it's a fascinating journey. But please do not think, please for a moment do not think that you know we are not vulnerable. You know, when you express your vulnerability, ladies and gentlemen, you become you. Never be shy of telling how messed up you are, how screwed up you are, and how you goofed up and what your failures are. Show me one great successful person and I will show you a laundry list of disasters associated with that. I've fought a crazy number of years to be where I am. Today, I mean, I'm just going to plug this factor in and I was telling Deepak my book, The Great Unraveling India After 2014, being published by Western will be out in the stalls on December 21 of uh, the coming month. And this is a book that probably more than anything else will tell you about not just about why the Congress hasn't done well, but it'll also tell you the faults within the Congress. Because I always believe that if you don't look within, you don't have a business to look outside. So Deepak and the entire team, you have been wonderful to me. And I want to say with one last line that my father and mother were doting parents. I lost both of them back to back. Uh, you know, they say when your parents become old, one goes after the other. And I lost them both back to back. But if they are to hear this recording, wherever they are in heaven, they'll feel proud that they're shy, diffident, scrawny, dark, silly, stupid, frightened little kid is out there today. And he's happy that he's doing it. Thank you very much.